Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Lunch with the Experts, a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host this week and every week. And I'm a filmmaker, I'm a writer, among other things, and I've been working with CCF for 10 years, folks. That is one decade. A lot has happened in this, uh, in this community and, and in this space in those 10 years. I've learned a lot, um, but I can't say enough, and I mention this every week, how fulfilled I have been to be a part of this community and help tell your stories. Uh, it's been one of the, the great parts of my career, and I sincerely mean that. Uh, so if you're signing on, um, go ahead and let us know where you are, uh, where you're signing on from in the world. Say hello. If you're new to the show, first of all, I want to say welcome and follow the lead of everyone else in the comments. Let them know where you're from. Say hello. I cannot encourage you enough to engage with the community. They will protect you. They will take care of you. They will share their experiences. They will help you along this journey. And we will as well. We're here every week. So I mentioned earlier that I've been working with CCF for 10 years to create video content, sometimes live videos like the one you're going to watch today, and sometimes uh, documentaries about patient stories, sometimes treatment-based videos, hundreds of videos that we have created over the past 10 years, and they all have the same mission in mind, and that is to educate people and, and, and raise awareness about neuroendocrine tumors. That is what we are here to do, and that's what we're going to do today. Before we get started, we always want to thank our sponsor, Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. We could not do this program without them, and we always have this disclaimer from them. And that is that the opinions expressed today by our guest presenters, as well as the questions that you all ask at home, haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Lunch with the Experts, and CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information that will be provided in the presentation. Audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest presenter today, and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. Okay, so as disclaimers often are, it's a lot of words. The real takeaway is that last line, which is like, look, we or our guests do not know your specific case, most likely today. And so we're gonna give you some great advice some some general direction, some answers to your questions. But because we don't know your specific case, take that information and that advice and those answers back to your home team, which does, and make the best plan and path forward for you. Because if there's anything I've learned in the past 10 years, it is that each case of this disease is unique and therefore each plan and path forward is as well. Okay, great show today. We have a new guest on the show that I'm very excited about, and I know that you will be too. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Nadine Malak to the show. Dr. Malak, how are you? Hi, good morning. Good morning. And thank you very much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. That was yeah. everyone watching. Yeah, we're happy to have you. So um, I know you a little bit now. We've talked a couple of times. Uh, but for those who may not know you or may not be familiar with the work that you do, tell us a little bit about the role that you fill in the neuroendocrine tumor community. So I'm a radiologist with subspecialty in the pathologies of the abdomen and pelvis, and I'm a nuclear medicine physician. So if you have questions about imaging of neuroendocrine tumors um, or PRRT, so that's, that's what I do, and that's my role um, in our multidisciplinary neuroendocrine tumor group. And where are you based out of? Where do you work? I am at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. Yes, yes. I don't, I, don't, I don't think we met when I was there, but I did film with uh, Dr. Mitra, mm -hmm. who I know you work with, and uh, a few other people. But I, I said this to him last time he was on the show. It's such a beautiful campus there. Like That was really uh, something that I enjoyed, just kind of up on the mountain there. That was really, really beautiful. So folks, uh, you heard Dr. Malak, and I know, and I already told her this, that every week you have questions about imaging, about PRRT, about the things that she specializes in. So I'm telling you, if you have those questions, which I know you do, today is the episode for you. And it could be the episode for someone else. So I encourage you, if you know someone, this is actually, I'll ask this of you. If you know someone who would benefit from being here today, has a question like that or any question about neuroendocrine tumors, let them know the show's going on. Remind them. People get busy. They forget that want to be here. So tag them in the comments, share the video, send them a text message, call them, fax them, whatever you got to do. We want to get as many people here as possible because even though you will be able to watch the replay as soon as this video is done today, so tomorrow, next week, whenever you can get to it, and there will be a lot of value in that, even if you can't make the show, the real benefit is, is getting this interactive one-on-one, -on -one, virtual one-on-one -on -one session with Dr. Malak today. So we want to get as many people here as possible. Uh, go ahead and start sending in your questions. I'm sure there are some there once I start churning through the comments. Uh, but one more thing I'll mention, and I do this every week as well. If you see comments or questions that you have in the, in the sidebar there, 
just right under it. You can like it or love it or any of the uh, emotions that Facebook allows you to use. They all work the same way for me. It shows me there's a demand for the question. I'm going to make sure I get that question across because inevitably we get so many questions every week. We, we just can't get to them all. That's why we have the show every week. We come back to try to get to them all eventually. Um, but if I see there's eight people that have this question about PRT, for example, I'm going to make sure I get that across. Okay. So that just helps me do my job better. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, and that helps me, you know, do my job, which is of course to serve you, uh, always a lot of Canada in the house. So I'm happy to see that. Um, yeah, a lot of good crowd are already churning in. Yes, yes, yes. Beaufort, Beaufort, South Carolina in North Carolina, we call it Beaufort. So I have a question, Dr. Malak. Uh, remind me, uh, well, how many years have you been kind of working in the neuroendocrine tumor space? Hmm. Um, I've been, so I've been really interested in neuroendocrine tumor and, and working on imaging for neuroendocrine tumor since hmm. probably 2015 is when I started my training. I trained, uh, I did my nuclear medicine training at the University of Iowa. Mm -hmm. And when I was there, um, the, the group, the nuclear medicine group at Iowa, they're they're really very strong <laughs> and um, they've been working on neuroendocrine tumor for a long time uh, before the Dota Tate update, the, the FDA approval of Dota Tate. So they were working on Dota Talk at that point. Mm -hmm. And that was at a, at a time when I was doing my fellowship in abdominal imaging and I got introduced to that field and I got very interested in it. And so I went to nuclear medicine and I did additional training in nuclear medicine and I got certified in that as well. Um, and during that time, I was working with them on um, with the Dota Talk imaging uh, before the FDA approval of Dota T. So that was really cool. And, and I thought, wow, like this makes a, a lot a lot of impact on, on patients' lives. So I, I that's how I got really interested in nuclear medicine to begin with. And, and I started working um, with the group at Iowa. And then I moved to Oregon in 2017 where mm -hmm. I started working in both nuclear medicine and abdominal imaging. How many of your patients are net patients, roughly, percentage-wise? Um, it's really difficult to tell. Okay. Um, in terms of therapies, a lot of them are neuroendocrine tumors now, um, with, with PRRT being available. In terms of imaging, we do a lot, a lot of variety of um, Fair. Tumor imaging, so neuroendocrine tumor is a subtype of them. Um, but in our multidisciplinary group, like given, given my background, um, I, I provide the input from like the imaging, molecular imaging with Dota Tate and FDG, which is also still plays a, a big role in neuroendocrine tumor, and for like CT and MRI um, and anatomic mm -hmm. imaging, what we call anatomic imaging. Got it. Um, well, Dr. Malak, we already have a lot of questions coming in, so I want to make sure that we start to uh, to chip away at some of those. So uh, if you're comfortable, I'm going to go ahead and pivot to some of the questions from the audience. Um, I, I'm definitely interested in learning more about what you do, but uh, we got a lot of questions, so we're going to start getting to some of them. First one comes from Simran, says, uh, liver metastatic uh, will PRRT be beneficial for me in this stage? That's kind of, kind of vague. You might need more information, but, but you can handle it or any way you want to, or we can talk about just like at what point where PRRT is most beneficial. Yes. Um, so there are multiple factors that, that play here. First, the site of the primary. For certain primaries, PRRT is more helpful. How much somatostatin expression there is on the disease, and that's the most important question, um, actually. And then if there are other options for the patient, and really each patient, like, like you started by saying, each patient is an individual case. Like for example, we always like to start with surgery, uh, which is of course like it's the surgeon world. It's not, <laughs> I'm not the person who performs that, but um, like usually if you can't take out the tumor, you wanna take it out. And mm -hmm. even the metastatic disease, which is, which is something unique to neuroendocrine tumor. Like for other cancers, most of the time when the disease is metastatic, you don't take it out. But for neuroendocrine tumor, if, you, if you're able to take out the primary and as much as you can for metastatic disease, if you can take, take out the bulk of the disease, um, you can actually positively impact the outcome of the patient. So we like to start with that if it's, if it's possible. Okay. Now, not everyone is a surgical candidate, but, um, and after that, when, this, when the disease progresses, it really depends on the grade somatostatin expression and other options for the patient. So for tumors of small bowel, 
um, that progress on, um, on octreotide, on some of the statin analogs, we do consider PRRT. Mm -hmm. um, for other sites, for pancreas and for lungs, there might be other options that could be considered other drugs that could be considered before that. Um, the key is really that the disease expresses somatostatin receptors on the cell surface. Otherwise, it okay. won't be treated with the RRT. Got it. Thank you for that. And uh, listen, Simran, if if uh, if you have a follow-up question, if that didn't quite get your question, please let us know if you're sticking around for the rest of the show. Chime in at any point. Um, and folks, I alluded to our video library or database at the beginning of the show. And so I just wanted to make a point uh, to that, you know, Dr. Malak was talking about essentially sequencing, right? This, which is a topic that often comes up and is, is often under discussion. And of course, if you talk to a surgeon, they'll, they'll usually say surgery first, but I know people discuss and debate this, but I just wanted to make a point that we pretty much have a video for like every topic. So if, for example, you heard her answer and you're like, well, I want to learn a little bit more about surgery. We have a video on that. Um, with some of the best, you know, surgeons in this space featured. So um, you can go to our YouTube channel or here on Facebook under the videos tab, and they're separated into little playlists and you can find videos on that. And this applies to like, you know, PRT, we have one nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to make that point that if you want to dive deeper, we've I've spent the past 10 years with CCF creating videos for you to do just that. So I just wanted to make that point. Yes. Um, yeah, I just want to mention also the liver directed therapy, which is also can be like a really good option for certain patients. So, uh, but but again, like we need to learn more about the case. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm sure those questions will come, will come up as well. Uh, so, OK, another PRT question from Janice. Janice says, I had my first PRT one month ago and it was a rough first five days. And now there's increased abdominal pain. Do the treatments get easier? What is up with this pain? Hmm. So um, usually not, not many patients have such amount of pain after hmm. um, PRRT. And um, so I, I, mean, I don't know the specifics of the case, but usually if there are a lot of symptoms, I'd like to get a CT. Um, so I'm not sure what her case exactly is. Uh, but some patients, if there's a lot of disease in the peritoneum, um, usually, so what neuroendocrine tumor does, it, it, it does like this moplastic reaction is what we call, it's just uh, fibrosis that attracts the bowel around it. So sometimes like the edema from the treatment can cause like symptoms of obstruction. And uh, so I'm not saying that that's what she has, like I, I, I don't know the specifics of the case, but if, right. if it's a lot of pain, um, it, it she might want to discuss with her with her treating physician and probably like consider imaging to see what the source of it is um, because usually fatigue is common afterwards for a couple of days after that but severe pain is is not really or like symptoms of carcinoid can get a little worse for the few days after prrt but but severe pain is right and it's not really common so um i, I just want to make sure that yeah. um it's not something that that needs more attention like a bowel obstruction or something like that. Got it. Well, hey, Janice, I'm sorry to hear that you're in pain, but hopefully that, that helps. And if you have a follow-up question, please let us know. Uh, folks, if you just joined us or joined us a little bit late, we are here with Dr. Nadine Malak. This is Lunch with the Experts, the Carson and Cancer Foundation program. And so far, we've been talking about PRT. And uh, I am sure we will talk about a lot of uh, scan-based topics today, but go ahead and continue sending in your questions. Next one comes from Lynn. Lynn says, um, started three and a half years ago. I'm guessing that was the diagnosis. Peanuts with a tail of pancreas removed, gallbladder and spleen removed, liver debulked, RFA of liver. So that's radio frequency ablation. Um, mm -hmm. and da, 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 da. Okay. And in January had bland embolization of liver. Very often I have very loud grumbling in the liver area. Is there any explanation of this, anything to help? The MRI showed decreased liver tumor size and less tumors, but there's this grumble, this loud grumbling. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. And I would think it's, it's the bowel movement because the liver does not, the liver should not cause that. So yeah. I think bowel movement um, was causing that. Anything that you think any person that Len should talk to or a certain thing that they, she should do to, to, to look further into that? Yeah, the oncologist or the surgeon, like you, yeah. 
Yeah. All right, Lynn. Uh, thanks for sharing your uh, that, Lynn. And let me know if you have any other questions. David says, "Hi, Rain and Dr. Malak from Australia. See, I told you we have people from all over the all over the world. Thanks, David. Glad you're here. Uh, from next question, yes, from Jan. What is the best imaging to diagnose carcinoid heart disease specifically? Yeah. So, so imaging is really where." Like that, that's, that's my, my specialty. So if there are questions about imaging, uh, those are probably where I'm gonna be able to answer most, um, like versus uh, stuff that are more related to uh, like other drugs or other therapies. Uh, so for carcinoid heart disease, um, echo is usually what, what we, we follow patients with. Uh, to, to actually follow the, the heart function. So to, to look into the disease burden and the disease involvement, um, we do our other modalities like MRI and CT and PET, but to look at the heart function um, echo and the function of the valves, which is gonna be affected and carcinoid heart disease echo is gonna be most helpful for that. Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, next question from Karen, who's a friend of the foundation. Good to see you, Karen. Uh, what drugs are used in PRT? And then uh, if you had a, a reaction, octreotide and lanreotide, what would be used then? So let's first take the, 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 the first part of uh, what exactly is uh, used in PRT. Yeah, so PRT, um, the concept of it is we have these neuroendocrine tumors that express somatostatin receptors on mm -hmm. their cell surface. And so the somatostatin um, analog, which are usually given to patients uh, to treat this disease, like octreotide and dendriotide, they go and they attach to these somatostatin receptors in order to treat the tumor. So with PRRT is a very similar concept, but we do attach um, a radionuclide that goes in and it, it delivers local radiation to the cell. So we give it IV and it goes to the blood, it, attached, it attaches to sites of neuroendocrine tumor and delivers local radiation. So, so that's really what we give. And the FDA approved agent for that is lutetium dotatate. So there are other agents that you can see in clinical trials mostly, or like used outside the US, but they're not FDA approved for use in the US. Um, so the one we use is lutetium dotatate. So that's the drug. Now, in order to protect the kidneys, because this drug is excreted in the kidneys and we want to minimize radiation to the kidneys, we give hydration um, and we give amino acid solution with the RRT to protect the kidney and it's amino acid um, based uh, arginine lysine solution. So the therapy would probably take 30 minutes of infusion, but it's much longer infusion to include the saline and the amino acids. So that's what goes with the RRT. Now, um, I, I wonder if the question is, uh, because the RRT is usually given along with somatostatin analog, like octreotide, lanreotide, um, or after progression on these agents. Now, if, if patients cannot get somatostatin analogs for some reason, uh, we could still go ahead with PRRT. So it's not like they have to take um, somatostatin analogs, otherwise we're not gonna be able to treat with PRRT. We could give PRRT without, um, like if the patient cannot have somatostatin analogs, we just don't wanna give them. Got it. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate your question. Um, next question from Jim. Okay. So my primary was in the pancreas about five years ago. I had 75% of the pancreas and spleen removed. Since then, the disease has been in my liver. Uh, multiple hepatectomies and gallbladder removed. Since then, I get MRIs uh, every three months to monitor my progression. Should I be getting other imaging periodically and should or and or should we be scanning other areas for early detection of potential spread? That's a great question. Um, and the choice of imaging, it also it, it depends on the on the disease, um, on the grade of the disease and the site of metastatic disease. So for liver, MRI is great. It's really the best imaging modality. Um, so although PET is super helpful, uh, MRI, it allows us to detect even smaller liver lesions than PET. And it allows us to actually measure the lesion more accurately, like to measure the size of the lesion and to be able to follow up the size of the lesion over time to see if it's progressing or not. MRI can allow us to do that perfectly. So for liver, it is the best modality. Now, a patients who have a pancreatic 
tumors, usually they, they develop peritoneal disease or disease in the mesentery less than small bowel, uh, than patients with small bowel primaries. So patients with small bowel primaries, we advise CTs occasionally because it's a little better for peritoneal disease. Now, the role of PET is um, to detect disease that might be occult on, on uh, CT or MRI. And it's mostly bones is the disease that hides on us most of the time that we see it very perfectly with PET. We could see it on MRI, but the thing with, with MRI is a very long scan. So we get it on one area of the body. We can't get it on the whole body. So PET is actually scans the whole body and it shows us the bone disease perfectly. So um, although there is no clear guidelines on how often should you get a PET, usually at staging, it's very helpful to see to actually what, what we're dealing with, where the disease is exactly. Is there something elsewhere other than just the liver and pancreas or or not, and every like some people um, recommended every two to three years that just to check and make sure that there's no other disease developing outside of these areas. So um, in his case, I think if the disease is mostly in the in the liver, MRI is perfect for that. Um, every once in a while, like probably two three years, the dotated pet is going to be helpful just to make sure it didn't go somewhere else that we're not aware of. Got it. Thank you. Uh, very important comment from Bridget, who says you guys are awesome. Well, I will receive that uh, <laughs> on behalf of the foundation, uh, Bridget, but I also want to flip it back around because I think that you are awesome. Uh, next question comes from Effie. This is about dip neck. And the question is, what is the imaging best to monitor dip neck? Uh, and can we, if we're able to, can we, um, uh, and she says diagnosed through pathology, by the way, but can we explain what dip neck is? Um, uh, dip neck. Uh, the lungs, right? The, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it is usually LCT. That's where. Okay. So we follow up LCT, and these are usually very small. And until we see it growing on CTs, like we we don't do more for that. Got it. Uh, next question from Beth: If the blood counts are lower limits, WBC platelets and ANC, would you continue PRRT or wait for improvement to continue? So it depends on how low. So there are uh, so there are levels of toxicity that if so, so sometimes patients start with lower levels because um, a lot of our neuroendocrine tumor patients have been treated with other therapies and sometimes they start with us with like platelets and white counts that are on low levels um, on the low end and so if if after the first treatment they don't drop much then we could just continue however if they drop below certain levels and we have thresholds for toxicity so if they drop below certain level we wait for them to recover and we wait up to 16 weeks for recovery. If they don't recover, then we stop. We won't continue. If they recover, then we treat with half dose. And if no toxicity develops with half dose, then we could continue with a full dose after that. Um, so that's the course of it. But they need to recover for us to continue the treatment. Okay, understood. Thanks, Beth. Appreciate your question. Um, from Azad, can MRI detect growth and new tumors uh, of any size? growth and new tumors of it depends on the location of the tumor really and um so for liver and pancreas mri is great um for bones like like i mentioned before sometimes that they're, they're occult on us on um on our anatomic imaging so um very important point to mention is whenever we do imaging of the liver and pancreas it has to be multi-phase so after IV contrast, we image in multi, multiple phases. So there is the early phase, which we call arterial phase, where the contrast is mostly in the arteries. Um, and a lot of neuroendocrine tumors show up on this phase. So we see them on the early one. Um, and then there's later phase, which is portal venous phase. And some of these tumors wash out then. But because the disease is heterogeneous, this is not the rule for all of the tumors. So some tumors actually do show up on the later phase more. And so that's why having multi-phase is very important for these patients. So, um, and I say that specifically for CT because for CT by default, if we just say CT of the abdomen and pelvis by default, it's portal venous phase, it's not multi-phase. So unless specified, 
And so neuroendocrine tumor patients are gonna need that. Uh, for MRI, usually MRI is multi-phase. So patients do get all these multi-phases. And so it's just important, it's very important to have the imaging done appropriately for us to be able to, to, to actually detect these tumors. Um, MRI is best for liver and it can detect smaller lesions um, compared to other imaging modalities. Compared to CT and to PET, MRI can detect smaller lesions in liver and pancreas. Got it. Thank you. So uh, Paula has a question, um, and often people have similar questions to this. She was diagnosed in 2005. I'm not sure where the primary was or, or how she was diagnosed, but no scans, octreotide, PET scan, CT, MRI have shown her her tumors. And so really the question is like, why would that happen? Like, what are the you know situation where you, your tumors wouldn't show up when you have been diagnosed? Yes, I'm assuming she has a non-primary, which um, I'm assuming from the history. So she does have tumor, which okay. probably is static to other organs, but okay. it's of a non-primary. I, I think that's that's the case from. Okay. That's what I would understand. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, in some cases, like we still don't know where the primary is. Mm -hmm. um, although this happens less frequently now that we have dota tape because it does help us detect a lot of these primaries that go by undetected on other imaging before we had dota tape but still like about half of the patients who have unknown primaries um, with dota tape we still don't see the primary so it, it does happen sometimes and um, the best explanation for that is that sometimes even when the primary is very small it can cause this metastatic disease that could go elsewhere even when it's too small so it, it, it remains occult on us but it, it does cause metastatic disease um, and that's typical with small bowel primaries where like you see the primary is very small and the metastatic disease is everywhere in the body um, yeah so unfortunately it still does happen Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Malak, talk to me a little bit about, I know there's a lot going on in the world of PRT now in terms of clinical trials, in terms of th you know, things that, that people are looking at, uh, whether that's you know, second round of PRT. Tell me about some of the things that are coming up that you think in the next couple of years that, that are exciting to you in, in the space in which you work. Yeah, so it's very exciting. The progress that happened already is very exciting because I think we're able to manage um, this disease much better than we used to just like a decade ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there is a lot more exciting stuff on the horizon. Um, so now, like in terms of repeat PRRT, we started seeing those patients who are coming back with disease progression. Now, we could talk a little bit about that if you'd like. So yeah. which patient do we consider for repeat PRRT? Um, and there are also the alphas who are on the horizon. That, like, those are like probably the two things that are um, that are in the nuclear medicine world that are coming up. Mm -hmm. um, and the sequencing. So those are like the trials are in, in that direction. So the repeat PRRT, um, the data we have so far shows that it actually helps if the patient responded the first time. Um, with probably it helps a little less and with a little higher toxicity, but it still um, uh, it, it still works and it's still safe. Um, and so for us to consider a patient for repeat PRRT, like first the tumor still has to express somatostatin receptors. And like we always recheck that. Um, and especially when the disease is growing rapidly, um, I sometimes like to get an FDG as well, just to make sure that the disease is still well differentiated. There are no areas that actually are more aggressive that won't be treated with PRRT. So we image with Dota date for sure, and sometimes with FDG if we need to, uh, before considering for repeat PRRT. And the patient must have responded the first time. And when, when we say responded, in most of the cases, we're able to slow down the disease, to actually just stop it from progressing rather than actually shrinking. So um, 
only about 18% of patients in the NATO one trial actually showed shrinking in their tumor, but the majority actually it stopped progressing and that's a success. Um, and some patients also we consider response if clinically they did better and their symptoms did way better. And so we have a lot of patients like that who did very well after the RRT the first time. And so if they progress um, after that, um, if they did not have toxicities with PRRT before, if they had good response, and if they're still showing some of the statin receptor expression, we consider them for retreatment. And there are trials uh, like the organist start um, now to show actually prospectively how much these patients benefit from repeat PRRT. Now, the other exciting development is the alphas, um, which we're all very excited about. Um, and the alphas, uh, so it's just the physics properties between alphas and betas. So each one of them has some advantages and disadvantages. Um, and so the alphas are like heavier particles. So they sit in place and they deliver higher radiation to the tumor itself. They don't travel around the tumor. And so that's why they, we, we expect that they're gonna have probably higher, um, they're gonna deliver higher radiation to the tumor and have less side effects. Um, and so there is like one paper that came out recently and it's with lead and it's showing like shrinking of the tumor and a lot of patients, like about mm -hmm. 80%, um, which is, is very exciting if, if that's the case. So, so those definitely like are on the horizon and actinium is the one we're looking, we're looking into. Um, and there's a trial opening later this year with actinium that we're like very excited about. Yeah. Um, and the sequencing is the the very important question also because right now um, we sit in multidisciplinary tumor boards uh, with experts from different specialties we look at the imaging we look at the history we look at the labs um, and then we decide based on on every patient's case uh, which drug to go with initially which therapy option to go with initially um, or like subsequently so the, we sequence the, the therapies um, and it's gonna be like really helpful to just have like solid trials that actually we have real like numbers that show how these therapies compare to each other in, in every setting. And, and there are trials starting on that. So, um, so definitely there's a lot of progress and, um, and it's, it's, it's moving in the right direction. So. Oh, that's exciting. That's exciting. I appreciate you sharing all that. Um, uh, okay, well, lots of more questions to, to get to. Folks, we are just about halfway done with today's show, so plenty of time to get those questions in. Next question from Effie. Effie says, what are your thoughts on microscopic disease that, that doesn't show up in imaging, but the net test shows progressive disease? Uh, I'm not sure if, if, you know, how much experience you have or knowledge about the net test, but yeah, so I, I, I'm not the person, the oncologists are, are the people who actually deal with net tests. So I, I don't, I'm not the person who orders it. Um, and I know that it's debatable among oncologists. Indeed. Like, yeah. it and, how. and so what net test does, it, it actually detects some genetic um, uh, stuff that are related to the to neuroendocrine tumor in the blood. So it's a very sensitive test. And it, it, it actually can, it can tell us before imaging if the tumor is recurrent or not. Uh -huh. And so I think, um, so it's definitely oncologists would be able to answer more as like, when do they use it exactly and how do they use it? But I think it can be very helpful, um, especially that neuroendocrine tumor patients especially when they're younger with a long life expectancy um, and we image them a lot. So if we're able to actually decrease the frequency of imaging and just like if we have better biologic markers or like better testing like the net test, mm -hmm. um, we could actually um, decrease the frequency of imaging, decrease radiation exposure to patients who are getting CTs and PET CTs frequently, and the cost. I mean, we'd like to think that we're in a world like where cost doesn't matter, but it actually does. Yeah. Right? A lot of patients like pay from like out of pocket or like have co-pays with each imaging modality. So, um, so I think it's another promising tool on the horizon. Um, it's still debatable in the oncology community and how much oncologists use it, but I think it's promising and it can be very helpful. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and thanks, Effie. And I, I, we get, we often get questions about the net test and I just want to reiterate, you may have heard this Effie. I know you're here pretty much every week, uh, but we have a video. The first luncheon with the experts episode actually was, was with uh, Dr. Maudlin who created the net test. So that whole episode was about the net test, uh, which indeed, as Dr. Malak said, is like, on, you know, under a lot of discussion, cause it's, it's kind of new. Um, so a lot of people are interested in it, but some people just don't, don't quite know enough about it, but it's very, very interesting. And I am certainly not the person to talk to about it, but we had the person or at least one of the people to talk to about it uh, on the show. So I would source that. It's literally the first episode of lunch with the experts. So if you go to lunch with the experts and scroll all the way back to July, 2020, I think, uh, there it is. Uh, next question from Ruby. If a gallium PET scan shows metastases to the skull, do you need a biopsy to confirm it? In the skull, it's a little tricky because um, there are other benign entities that can show those that they don't think. And I wonder if that's what, uh, what the question is about because there is a benign lesion called meningioma and a lot of people have it. It's like a common um, lesion and it's benign. We don't need to do anything about it, but it can light up on dotatate fat. So usually it's, it's really rare to have one metastasis to the skull and nothing elsewhere in, in the rest of the bones. So usually if there's metastatic disease to the bones, like you'd see more than this one metastasis only to the skull. So sometimes MRI can help and it can show us like clearly that this is a meningioma and it's not um, a metastasis. Um, so sometimes on fat, like we can't tell for sure. So we get an MRI and the MRI can answer the question. Now, if we're still unsure after that, then probably if, if your doctor is suggesting biopsy, then, then there have been like the tests that have been done and they're still unsure. Um, but, but usually that's, that's the reasoning is like those pitfalls in the skull, like the, these benign lesions that can, um, that can basically mimic neuroendocrine tumor metastasis with their uptake on dotatate. Got it. Thank you. Um, and thanks for your question, Ruby. Uh, from John, the question is about imaging after each PRRT treatment. And mm -hmm. so this kind of a two-part question, the, the, the first one is just like, can we talk about it? You say, please explain. But then there's a smaller secondary question in, and is fasting necessary? So let's just talk. It's not necessary. Okay. So we check, we check that one off. So, so this yeah. is a bigger question about, so just talk to us about the imaging that happens after each uh, treatment or uh, of PRRT. Yeah, so we usually don't image. So another okay. one trial they imaged um, mm -hmm. in between the cycles um, once, like in the middle. But we we don't do that, and it's really not necessary and not really helpful um, to image, unless like. For example, our first a question today was a patient is having a lot of pain. So we'd like to know why the why why there's pain, right? So if there is a reason to image in between cycles, we do that. But if not, if the patient is doing okay, we just continue, we do the four cycles and then we restage afterwards. Um, and this restaging afterwards, we rely on uh, the size of the lesion on CT and MRI mostly to see if the lesion shrunk or not. Um, and if it's stable, it's a success. So if the disease, if we actually stopped it from continuing to grow, this is a success. And we rely on the size and not on the degree of uptake on PET. And that's an important point too, because these diseases, um, our most common PET that we use for other cancers is, is FDG PET. And with FDG path, if the degree of, of uptake goes down, we say that this is response. So it correlates with that. But that's not the case with dotatate. And that, that's an important point. So we don't rely on the fact that the uptake on PET went down to say that it is um, the tumor is responding or not. We, we, we rely on the size of the lesion and on whether we have lesions that have resolved or lesions that appeared newly on the PET. So those are the criteria to say that. And we give it time. This, this treatment takes time to work. So if we image with very short intervals, like we're not going to be detecting much. So we just give it time to work. And commonly in patients with who have been treated with PRRT, we image after the therapy, like three months and then six months. And then you see it either shrinking slowly with time when it's responding or just staying stable. And so that's the imaging post-PRRT. Um, so size based on CT and MRI and PET 
which um, according to guidelines from the society of, uh, from SNMMI, the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging is like, it's just, it gives you a new baseline for the future also to see where the disease is at. at that point. So that's how we deal with imaging for the neurological consumer. There's a little bit of variability like between institutions and different approaches, like how frequently they get it. Um, but there's no need to image a lot. We can just distance it. Lovely, thank you. Uh, so earlier, not too long ago, we mentioned, we, we discussed uh, a case where the primary was unknown. So we have another question about that situation. Samantha says, I'm still primary unknown since diagnosis of 2020, uh, stage four with metastases to the liver. So what's the best imaging to find my primary? And I'm sure this is a common uh, issue for people. Yeah, so if Dota T doesn't show it, that's our most sensitive imaging then unfortunately we're not gonna know. So, and sometimes after that, like when the, when the, the surgeon would go in and would, they would just scroll the bowel, like they, they look at the bowel carefully because this is the most common side of it usually. So they look at the bowel and they see if during surgery they could find it. But by imaging modality, it's, it's, if we don't see it by Dota tape, then unfortunately it's gonna stay a non-primary for the time being, like in the future, if we have more sensitive modalities or if we have like better ways in the future, you never know, but who knows, so yeah. far, who knows? But so far is Dota Tate pets. Got it. Thanks, Samantha. Um, I'm not sure if I've seen your name before, uh, but if I haven't, hello and welcome to the show. And if I have, my apologies, welcome back. Uh, from Rose, how effective is PRRT on metastatic peritoneal tumors? So it is effective, although, um, so peritoneal disease is the, we have like this dysmoplastic or this fibrotic reaction that neuroendocrine tumors create around them in the mesentery. And so this is thought to be like the, the reason why they might be responding a little bit less than other sites, but they do respond. Like we've seen like really good responses in, the, in peritoneal disease for PRRT, but it appears to be a little bit less than other sites. So there is this new paper that the group at Vanderbilt published recently where they have like this score, they came out with a score um, of, that predicts the response to PRRT. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a really nice paper. I, I, I liked it a lot. I like the work they did a lot because, because it helps us with our reasoning and with our rationale and with like just trying to think of what to expect when we give PRRT. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, higher scores uh, were like, so, so the, so the uh, what they looked into is like the symptoms and the involvement of critical organs and peritoneal disease, like was one site specifically that we're looking into and whether the patient had chemo before or not. And they showed that like, basically the higher the score is, the poorer the prognosis is gonna be. And one of these, contributors to higher score is peritoneal disease by itself, mm -hmm. in addition to the degree of involvement of other critical organs. Um, yeah, so it does respond, but probably a little less than other places. Got it. And uh, folks, uh, pertaining to the paper that Dr. Malak mentioned, um, I think it was Dr. Nanu Das uh, yeah. that we had on the show a few episodes back. And we talked about that paper. It was just right when it had come out. And so what is it now? It's March. I, uh, that might have been January, maybe February. There's only been a few months of this year. It was this year. <laughs> so um, if you want to learn more about that specifically, we talked about it on the episode. Uh, and shout out to Dr. Doss. He's been on the show a couple of times. Great team over there at Vandy. Um, okay, we've got just about 15 minutes left. Um, oh, I like this question. Um, kind of not so specific, kind of a bigger question. Karen says, are most nu nuclear medicine doctors familiar with neuroendocrine cancer? Which we know we, we, we know uh, you are in this case, but what about most uh, neuro nu nucle nuclear medicine doctors? Yeah, so just like all other specialties really, like surgery and oncology and radiology and nuclear medicine. Um, so neuroendocrine tumor is not a very common disease. Although like when you're at a place where you're at a referral center for neuroendocrine tumor, you think like everyone has neuroendocrine tumor right. because you see it a lot. <laughs> it's like, yeah. But if you're, um, if you're practicing um, at a community level hospital, then you don't see a lot. So all specialties, not only nuclear medicine, they see less of this tumor. So they have less experience with it. Um, 
so it, it is, um, we study it in, in our radiology residency programs. We study how we image these tumors and um, our residents definitely learn how to image these tumors. But of course, um, physicians who are practicing in more community level, they're gonna see less. So they, they're just gonna have less exposure to the disease. Got it, thanks, Karen. Um, from Yvonne, a small rectal carcinoid net confirmed through pathology, rest of the tumor removed, awaiting confirmation through pathology. So what is the, the, the typical course of con confirming the only location of the net and, and of course, staying, of he staying ahead? Yes. So in most cases, um, a dotatate PET is going to be helpful initially to make sure that the disease didn't go anywhere else. Sometimes, I don't want to speak for the surgeon or the oncologist who are actually taking care um, uh, um, of him, but sometimes when the, it's just a very tiny polyp and they think it's just, they got it all out, they mm -hmm. just stop there. And so I'm not sure exactly what the grade and what the size of his lesion is, but usually if the uh, usually initially a dotatate pet is going to be helpful to make sure that the disease is still localized and it was all taken out. Um, and from there, the follow-up is going to depend on the grade of the tumor, on the size, and what initial imaging is going to show. Got it. Thank you. Uh, folks, this is a question for anybody on the call today. Uh, Cheryl says, and you may have already commented this, I can't see the, the most recent comments. Cheryl says, can anyone recommend who to see in the Boston area for a newly diagnosed pancreatic net? Uh, and Dr. Malak, if you know someone too, but uh, but anyone else that that knows, uh, that's part of what we do here on the show is is share our experiences as well. So let's try to help Cheryl out if we can. Um, next question from David for Dr. Malak: Do gallium sixty eight PET scans pick up uh, cancers other than carcinoid or neuroendocrine? Uh, so, for example, would it pick up prostate cancer? Yeah, it it can. So it is. Um, so first, there are variations of neuroendocrine tumors that are like sometimes, for example, FIO and para, they're like kind of a type of neuroendocrine tumor. There is like the medullary um, thyroid cancer, which is also kind of like a type of it, and those show up on the scan. But also in prostate cancer, there are some reports on neuroendocrine differentiation of prostate cancer showing up on those data. So it can happen if it's a neuroendocrine differentiation of the prostate cancer. Um, now, some other cancers can show up a little bit, and that's because just they have higher vascularity. So there's more vascularity. So there's more tracer coming into these sites, uh, but they usually don't light up as much as neuroendocrine tumors do. So uh, most of the time we're able to tell. Uh, but yeah, neuroendocrine differentiation of prostate cancer can show up. Got it. Thank you. Um, next question from Aaron. Aaron says, I was diagnosed with carcinoid cancer a few weeks ago. Sorry to hear that, Aaron, but I'm glad you found your way to us in the show. Uh, mine is in the right, right bronchial tube at the, uh, at the end by the lung. From what I've researched, it is not normally found there. So my question is, how common is it that this type of cancer has or will spread to other areas? My dotatate scan is scheduled for the 6th. And I'm trying to do as much research as I can so I can be prepared as possible. That is a, a great strategy, Erin. Any, any advice for Erin, Dr. Malak? Um, so she's definitely doing the right thing, um, So which is like to stage the tumor initially. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, tumor endocrine tumor is like really, it, it depends on the grade. And in lungs, the grading in the lungs is a little bit different than right. the grading of the uh, small bowel and pancreas. So we have, we call them typical and atypical carcinoid. So the atypical have a more aggressive behavior than the typical ones. Um, they do show up, the majority of them show up on dotted date, but they show up less. So they express somatostatin receptors less than in the abdomen and pelvis. So the, the first step is definitely what, what she's doing, which I'm sure she had a CT of her lungs. Um, and so she has a good evaluation of her lungs, I'm sure, and of like the nodes in the chest. And those are gonna be the first site. So when the tumor goes anywhere, it's gonna go first to these nodes in the chest. Um, and the dotatate pet is gonna give us a better idea. First, does her disease express some of the statins? If it does, then you can stage it with dotatate PET. If it doesn't, then you can't stage it with dotatate PET, unfortunately. So if, if her primary lesion is not showing up on dotatate PET, then we cannot rely on the scan to say that there is that it didn't spread anywhere else. Um, then there are other options for that 
on, and FDG PET is one of them. Got it. Thank you. Uh, from Vicky, is there a limit to the number of PET scans, CT scans you can have in a year? In a year? So there is no limit, but in a year, it's like a short period of time to have a lot of imaging. So mm -hmm. the frequency of imaging is going to depend on first, like, do we have metastatic disease? And second, how quickly it's progressing and the tumor grade. So in disease that's progressing quicker, um, usually we get like shorter time follow-ups, like every three months. But in the majority of neuroendocrine tumors that are slow growing, you don't need imaging more frequent than six months. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, unless they're, they're growing quicker than that and you need evaluation shorter. But for the majority of patients, they could wait um, six months. And like also if there is, if it remains stable or very slowly progressing, then you can distance it even further. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I should say that dotatate PET is not, most of the time, just CT and MRI, like for these short-term follow-ups, just do the work. So you don't need to, to do a lot of dotatate PETs okay. unless the majority of disease is in areas that we don't see on CT and MRI. Like if the disease is it mostly in bones, and like you're doing CT and you don't see it, then like you're not gonna be able to see it on follow up. Like it's not gonna give you much information. So then you're gonna need frequent dotatate pads. But otherwise, like um, most of most of the time, CT and MRI like, do a good job, and we do dotatate pads occasionally in between. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, from Joan, who is here on behalf of her husband. Hi, Joan. My husband has just finished his third PRT uh, treatment, but continues to have frequent daily bowel movements with some diarrhea. Sanostatin and lanreotide doesn't help the uh, symptoms. And this has been going on for two years now. So he's being treated for pancreatic uh, enzyme in, uh, insufficiency due to long-term sanostatin use. Uh, and he's also taken Lomatil. Uh, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce that. Is this a common side effect with sandostatin is the question. And can we expect improvements with PRRT? So it is a common symptom of neuroendocrine tumor, especially when it's metastatic. Um, and some patients do get benefit with PRRT, but it definitely is not always the case. Like you have some patients who respond really well, some patients who don't respond at all, who continue mm -hmm. to progress. So it's uh, so what the data we have is like the average of all patients, but there are like individual variations in that. So um, PRRT for some patients, it does help with control of symptoms for a lot of patients actually. Um, so for the question, whether it's related to the octreotide or not, I, I would leave that to the an oncologist who would be able to answer about uh, the drugs much more than, than I can. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, we've mentioned uh, lung nets a couple of times today. And so, so uh, our friend Pat says, can PRT be used for bronco slash pulmonary uh, nets? Yes, it can. Um, it can. So usually, like, like we said earlier, so the degree, the somatostatin receptor expression on lung carcinoids is a little bit less than the pancreas and bowel. But if it does express somatostatin receptors, then yes, we can treat it with PRRT, but usually not. Um, like usually we try other drugs first. So we try Everolimus, for example, first, and then if it progresses on other drugs, we treat it with PRRT. So, so far it's not recommended before other systemic therapies, which is like in small bowel, for example, if there's progression um, on somatostatin analogs, we could just go ahead and treat with PRRT. The and there is like the data we have so far supports that. For mm. the lungs, we usually wait until there's progression on other systemic therapies. Uh, but the key really is, does it express somatostatin receptors? Sometimes, like, so typical carcinoids do express somatostatin receptors more than the atypical ones. But even in the typical ones, sometimes like, you just need to image to make sure that they do, because sometimes they don't. And so that's the key. Does it express somatostatin receptors? Um, and okay. it has to express somatostatin receptors more than liver to consider the patient eligible for PRRT. So the expression has to be more intense than liver. Got it. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, Pat. Good to see you. Uh, Laura says, I just had my second PRRT and I also had a bilateral, bilateral adrenalectomy. Should there be additional follow-up for cortisol levels? I just had an episode of adrenal crisis one week before my second uh, PRRT. 
Yes, and uh, that's like the, the oncologist would be able to manage that. I I, I wouldn't want to speak for, for her oncologist, but um, I, I assume they would, yes. Okay. Uh, from Marlene, can the gallium-68 PET scan show nets in the bladder? I've been told that no imaging can see through the bladder. Yeah, so the bladder is tricky because the dotatate so it's excreted in urine. So if you look at an image of a dotatate pet, the kidneys are really hot because they're excreting the tracer and then it goes and it accumulates in the bladder. So it's really, it's a really tricky site to image. Um, so we could image it with um, CT or MRI, but really for bladder, cystoscopy is the best. So like the, the, they go in with a scope and they could look at the bladder and they could biopsy also. Um, so that's, that's really the best way. Um, MRI um, is next, I would say. But dotatate, yes, because of this urinary excretion, it's just, it's gonna be like a lot of radioactivity just in this bladder. And so it's gonna be really difficult to detect if there is any tumor on the wall of this bladder while it's full of radio tracer. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Diane has a question It says, why does a patient have pain for it from a neuroendocrine tumor? Does pain indicate the net uh, growing or metastases or, or, or what? Any thoughts on, on where that pain generates from? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure, but it is one of the symptoms of, of neuroendocrine tumors. And that's how a lot of patients get diagnosed with that. They have like vague symptoms like non-specific pain they just like have this discomfort um and then they get imaged and that's how we see the tumor mm -hmm. um and also when it, when it progresses with time so, so, so the disease progression can cause pain so if there are large tumors they can cause pain if they're large in the liver then they could cause like also um like mass effect and pain but it, it can be seen with neuro, with neuroendocrine tumors even without like this disease progression got it thank you so, Dr. Malak, I know that often, and we've talked about the, you know, the component of radiation today uh, a few times, um, and I know sometimes patients are, are fearful of, of that when it comes to, to nuclear medicine. Can you talk to me a little bit or pretend I am one of those patients that's concerned about the amount of radiation I'm putting in my body? Like, how concerned should I be? What should I be looking out for? How much is too much? Yes, so it is risk versus benefits. And it is, um, so you have to take it in case by case. So if it's a young patient who have a very long ex life expectancy, mm -hmm. like basically most of their disease is out um, and they have a long life to live, um, then we don't want to be imaged them like CT every three months, you know? It's like, that's basically like too much. So MRI can come to help here. So you could alternate with MRI for a lot of patients, especially that the most common site of disease is the liver and MRI is great for that. So using MRI as much as we can, we could decrease radiation quite a bit. Um, now for if, if patients who have metastatic disease that's already like widely spread, then being on top of just detecting if there's a new sites of metastatic disease or progression of metastatic disease is way more important than the radiation risk. So if you want to weigh it like this, it's like, if there's metastatic disease, then we need to follow that up and we need to be on top of that. And that's going to be our highest priority. And the radiation risk is really going to be minimal. And it's, it's, it's most probably not going to affect on the long term uh, when we have a much larger issue to deal with, which is the metastatic cancer. Now, MRI for younger, healthier individuals, and I'm saying younger because um, the older we get, first, the less sensitive to radiation we're going to be, and also, like, the life expectancy to develop secondary tumors that are caused by radiation is basically going to be shorter, right? So that's why, like, if there's a, an 18-year-old individual that we're going to be imaging a lot, I'd worry much more about radiation uh, compared to... Uh, a much older individual who has metastatic disease. And so it's, it's, it's really um, like risk versus benefits. So MRI and also like our newer modality is the CT and the PET CT, we're managing to go down on the radiation quite a bit over time. So um, our, our newer uh, scanners 
just go down with the with the radiation quite a bit. Got it. Thank you so much. Well, folks, that is our hour. That is our show for today. Dr. Malak, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you sharing some time and, and your experience and expertise with us. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for having me. Absolutely. And listen, I don't have an actual medal for this, but if I did, I would give you one for the most stylish glasses on Luncheon with the Experts. I have to say those are just <laughs> chef's kiss. I really love those. Uh, and thanks to you all at home for joining us at, uh, as always, and we hope this question, this uh, program helped answer some of your questions. And I'll reiterate, and I also, Aaron, I just want to make sure that you know that I saw your last question. We're just out of time, and you have an appointment, a pre-op appointment coming very soon. Uh, so this is for anybody. Just please know that CCF is here for you. Reach out. If you didn't get a question answered or if you have a follow-up question, I, I urge you to watch the program again, look at any of the videos that we have, but also follow up. You can message CCF here. Uh, you can DM them. Or, or directly message them on Facebook or reach them at carcinoid.org and they will get you the information or the person who can get you the information that you seek. But we hope this program helped help answer some of your questions and we will be back uh, next week. We also want to thank our presenting sponsor, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals. We could not do this program without them. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. Thank you for watching. I have been your host and please join us next time on Lunch with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye.